president of the Harlan Institute, which does things like this, outreach to high school students, teach them about uh, Supreme Court and the Constitution. Um, so he's going to talk to you all today about the UT Affirmative Action case. And I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. You are very lucky to sort of have a nice professor, a uh, nice teacher, one of my best students. <coughs> and I really enjoy having my class. So, everyone here is a senior? Yes. yes. Everyone in college next year? Yes. <laughs> yes. Who here is looking to go to the University of Texas for college? Wow. Okay. Who here is in the top 10% of your class? Wow. So basically all of you are going to be guaranteed to go to UT, right? You know how that works? If you're in the top 10% of your class at Texas High School, you can go to the University of Texas. But who here wants to go to UT is not in the top 10% of your class? Okay. So do you guys know what affirmative action is? Have you ever studied that before? Yes. Okay. Who wants to tell me what affirmative action is? Tell me. <laughs> Come on, you said you know what it is. It wasn't a trick question. They look at your race as a basis of you. Right. The phrase affirmative action means you are taking action affirmatively to balance out racial diversity. Does anyone know why schools use affirmative action? To get more for past discrimination. Okay. Anyone? Other reasons? It's a big word. It begins with a D. Schools love to use it. Diversity. Diversity. What's diversity? And why do schools want diversity? To enrich your learning experiences. You can learn from other people with different experiences, with different backgrounds, right? So affirmative action has had a kind of a weary, really long history in this country. And um, it's been very controversial. You, you're absolutely right. One of the reasons why we can have affirmative action is to make up for past discrimination. Another reason why is for purposes of diversity. But the reason you said, which I think is quite valid, is not the reason the, uh, affirmative action has been upheld. The reason why is because of diversity. The court, Supreme Court has not said we have affirmative action to make up for the fact we have racism in this country. They've used the rationale that we need diversity. We need people to look different. We need people to have different backgrounds and, and walks of life in, in, in schools in our country. So that's why we have affirmative action. Now, what's the problem of affirmative action? Reverse discrimination. What does that mean? It's uh, rather than um, like catering to people ranked just on merit, we've had problems with people um, like making ratios or specific numbers of, uh, or quotas of different types of races they needed for their colleges. Okay. Anyone else? Any other problems with affirmative action? What's that? Discrimination against whites. Discrimination against whites. Elaborate. Uh, well, instead of discrimination against the like, other races, like women and minorities, the discrimination against whites, uh, because usually. <laughs> well, why do you call it discrimination? You don't want to be your own similar mind thinking. By setting the quotas of the different races, like I was saying before, it made like um, the, where they would keep a student that had um, less merit to be in the position um, just because they had a different race. Okay. Who here knows what a quota is other than this guy? Yes, ma'am. So you guys might not know this, but quotas are not used anymore. In the olden days, in the 70s, schools did use quotas. For example, in a very famous case, University of California versus Davis versus Bakke, this was an affirmative action case, the med medical school had about 100 seats, and they reserved 16 seats out of 100 for minority applicants. They reserved a very specific number. And the Supreme Court in 1977 said that was unconstitutional. So after that, they don't use straight up quotas. But they also, what they do now is something a little bit more holistic. They take race as one of several factors. For example, at the University of Michigan, in their affirmative action program, they measure SAT scores, right? If a person happened to be white, a certain SAT score would pretty much guarantee they get in. If a person happened to be black, 
the SAT scores again was significantly lower. So schools ditched the use of quotas and they changed the amount of points that could be used to get in. The Supreme Court said that that program too was unconstitutional. So schools started just using race as one of several factors in a more kind of broad and general holistic way. But let's, let's look again. Why does the Supreme Court care about affirmative action? What about affirmative action gives the Supreme Court business to rule about it? Well, that, that's a very good point. Justice Thomas got into Yale Law School. And he's been very critical of Yale for admitting him only because he's black. So, uh, the 14th Amendment. Ooh, what's the 14th Amendment? Do we have a constitution handy? <laughs> no? You actually put it in every pocket. I have two. <laughs> Whoever tells me the 14th Amendment provisions gets to keep this constitution. I wasn't planning, but you carry a couple. All right. Which, which 14th Amendment provision is applicable? Yes, sir. What does that say? Good, all right, pass it back. I should have more I thought about it. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared enough. That's right. So the 14th Amendment, passed in 1868 after the Civil War, says, all persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States in the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall bridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor, this is the important part, deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. I'll read that again. No state shall deny to any person within its jurisdictions the equal protection of the law. What does that mean? Everyone's equally protected on the same laws no matter what race you want. Okay. So what does that mean? Um, the states are required to provide equal opportunity, although not necessarily equal results in terms of protection. So say, for example, you know, a state, let's say Kansas, passes a law saying that schools must be segregated, that black students and white students have to go to different schools. Would that, would that violate the equal protection clause? Yes. Yes. What case am I talking about? Good, Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. That's exactly correct. The 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. Brown versus Board was in 1955. So for almost 70 years after the 14th Amendment was ratified, we had segregated schools. And really, they don't teach you this in school, but Brown didn't really end everything. Schools did not become segregated until about a decade afterwards. And in fact, there were a number of school districts in Virginia elsewhere that shut down rather than have the students uh, uh, put together in the same schools. So they actually shut down the schools rather than have the black and white students in the same classroom. It's actually an entire generation of the people in areas of Virginia had no education because the schools were not operated under Brown. They just shut down instead. But what about affirmative action? Is giving preference to a African American student discrimination? Well, okay. Who do you think? No. Anyone else? Does giving preferences? <laughs> Is giving preferences to African Americans discrimination? Is that a bad thing? Who really thinks no? No what? No, it's not a bad thing. Who thinks that affirmative action is not discrimination? Okay, four people. So why do you think so? It, in a way, it's not. It could be looked at that um, since for so long there was no education being brought to African Americans as a way to kind of speed things up in order to get them on the same track that. Whites have had for hundreds, So it's simply making up for past discrimination. 
Okay. Anyone else agree with uh, those two students? Okay. And I think that that's a very good point. I think you raise a very interesting issue. I mean, for, 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 for years, and really for centuries, um, African Americans in this country were given a really, really raw deal. Um, I'm sure you learn about this in American history, but for most of the 20th century, most of the 19th century, most of the 18th century, African Americans are treated as second class citizens. And in many respects, it might be hard for them to make their way into college as a first time. <clears throat> you know, a lot of a lot of people might have had you know, family members who went to the University of Texas. They might have, you know, uncles or aunts, someone helped them out. There's legacy admits, if you know what that is. If you have a family member gone to a good school, you probably get an also. African Americans might not have that same benefit. But along the same point, how long do you think this type of preference has to last? You know, we're in the year 2012, where we're only you know, 60 years away from the assassination of Martin Luther King. We're not that far away from, from this stuff. What about another 25 years? Do you think it'll still be, uh, still be as necessary? No. <coughs> no? Why? What about in 25 years, will they still need affirmative action? No. Why do you think no? Because as time goes on, the more people that we have, the more integrated our schools become, the less of a need that we'll need for any kind of affirmative action, because most people will be equal. Okay. So 25 years or so, when you guys are you know, in your 30s sometime, it's scary, right? <laughs> Seriously, it is scary. <laughs> It wasn't that long ago I was in high school and I'm looking at you and it's kind of, it's kind of startling. 40s? Yeah. Oh, God, I'll be, in 25 years, I'll be, I'll be 53. I'm your mom's age, yeah. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Okay, so the reason why I use the number 25 years is that in 2003 there was an affirmative action case at the Supreme Court called University of uh, Michigan versus Grutter. And there the Supreme Court narrowly upheld the use of affirmative action very narrowly. Justice O'Connor, who's now retired, wrote the court that affirmative action only exists in very narrow circumstances. And she said, and maybe in 25 years we won't need this anymore. It's this notion that affirmative action is kind of a temporary remedial program. And you need it just for a little bit to get past these rough humps. But in the future we won't need it nearly as much. What does anyone what think about that? That, you know, Affirmative action is okay today, but you know maybe in 20, 25 years, and really that, that opinion was from 2003. What year were you all guys born in? So when you were eight years old, this opinion came out. You know, that was that was what almost a decade ago. So we're already almost like 15 years in. You know, so in the year 2028, when you're you know roughly going to be you know moving on with families and stuff, will we still need affirmative action? Will the past you know remnants of racism in this country be gone so that we don't need affirmative action. <laughs> Who thinks yes? Who thinks in 25 years, even from today, that we won't need affirmative action anymore? <coughs> All right. Who here thinks no, that we might need it for the indefinite future? Why, why do you think we'll need it forever? Green shirt. Okay. Well, racism won't be present, but like socioeconomic differences is what we have in America. So, like, to think that in 25 years that this, like, all states will, oh, well, let's give this prominent, uh, like, this mostly black school the same money as this mostly white school and the education between them, it's, it depends on, like, there, there are going to be, like, like, racial, like, schools, like, mostly, that's, like, Hispanic schools and black schools, and you can assume that their quality, like, some of the quality of the schools is going to be, you know, Anyone else? In the back? I think um, I would be wrong to, like, there won't be, be necessarily the minority that needs the help, but there will be a new minority that will need um, some help in that sort of area. Well, you raise a very good point. Uh, the University of Texas's affirmative action problem doesn't just apply to black people, it applies to Hispanics. 
And in Texas, in the very near future, Hispanics will actually constitute a demographic majority. Um, that, that's just a matter of numbers. That there will be more Hispanic people in Texas than there will be white people. Does anyone think when white people become a minority, should they get affirmative action? <laughs> I, I'm glad you're laughing. I'm glad you're laughing. That's a very, it's, a very good, uh, it's a very good point to consider. That it isn't really just about majority and minorities. It is focusing on people who are historically oppressed. For example, Asians, Asian Americans. They're a very distinct minority, yet they don't get any affirmative action benefits. In fact, it's the opposite. Asians actually have to get higher scores than white people get into good schools. If you're in California, they actually penalize Asians because their SAT scores are extremely high. Um, so uh, it's not about. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they're they're ahead. It's not so. It's not really about minority in a number sense. It's about focusing on groups that are historically disadvantaged. But Asians are a very small percentage of the population, and they tend to do extremely well in, in standardized testing and admission to, to colleges and such. So, even if blacks do majority, minorities do minority. I don't think that matters. I think what some of you have hit it on that this is about historical discrimination and re remediating that and fixing that. That's what this is about. Okay. Anyone else? In some places, yes, in some places, not. Uh, the different schools have different policies. For example, in Michigan, our firm, I, think, I think Native Americans might get uh, benefits. Other schools, they don't. I don't know the details. But some, some schools do, some schools don't. Um, another like weird wrinkle, if you're Cuban, you're not considered Hispanic for most firm of action programs. So you do not get the benefits of affirmative action. Why are you considering Well, uh, they say because Cubans historically were not oppressed in the same sense that Hispanic Americans were. <laughs> right. So my, 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 <laughs> issues of race and defining which races get in, which races get out. Uh, you know, I'm Jewish. Jewish people are a very small sector of minority. We're very much oppressed. We get no affirmative action. So uh, you know, they're very. You know, the entire 1937 to 1942 period is pretty bad. So, you know, <laughs> so there are a lot of there are a lot of wrinkles in how um, races are defined. Uh, women, for example, in some areas, women can constitute the majority. That there are more women in a school than men, um, but they're still considered a minority. So there are a lot of there are a lot of wrinkles with how affirmative action kind of cuts both ways. But so now a related issue. I asked before who here thinks that affirmative action is, um, you know, not discrimination. Why would affirmative action be a form of discrimination? Why would it be? Yes, sir. It gives boons to certain races. What do you mean boons? Like you said, uh, if a white person scores really high in an SAT, they guarantee the spot. But a black person can score a little lower and still be guaranteed a spot. And if they give boons to certain races, it's still discrimination no matter what. Um, someone from a minority gets preference over someone that makes higher higher scores than them from the majority or majority. So the person that has a high more merit to be in the school gets mm -hmm. skipped over for admission. Because it's not actually equal, because it's giving more chance of being admitted into a university. To a different race other than, let's say, white That's a very good point. I mean, say for example, you know, Tiger Woods' child applies to some college somewhere. You know, his mother, you know, was a white, you know, was, was a Swedish supermodel. I mean, the father was African American. Probably because more money than anyone you can ever imagine. You know, should this person be given preferences versus, you know, perhaps some some white kid who lives in a very bad neighborhood, but his, both his parents were white. You talk about socioeconomic. That's a very good point. When you check off that box on your application, and you're all probably applying for college in the next couple months, I think, there will be a checkbox. It'll say, what's your race? And you're going to have to check up one of those boxes. And there's not going to be a box for socioeconomically diverse, or I have a really good life story. There are only these broad, you know, you can write your college essay, but there are only these broad kind of categories, like white, black, Hispanic, 
Asian. Other. Yes, if you check other, that, that generally means white um, <laughs> for the most part. So th there's also the other issue, and you mentioned Justice Thomas. There's a stigma attached to affirmative action, which is something that's very damaging. So if you are a minority, and you happen to get to a very good school, and this is by no means correct, but some people might assume, well, they got into that school because of affirmative action. How, how do you think that make you feel? If you got into a school, you know, you're a minority, you got into a good school, your grades were solid, your grades were just as good as everyone else, and someone says, hey, you're only here because you got affirmative action. How do you think that make people feel? Pretty bad. Yeah. And that's what Justice Thomas... Make you feel less than other people. Right. So is this upholding racism then? Just the judgment based on race? Well, I'm just talking about your classmates. I'm not talking about the law right now. I'll get to that in a minute. Yes, ma'am. I don't think it would, I think it would make you feel like you didn't really have anything necessary to offer. But I mean, like, you think you can go to college and you think, okay, well, you're smart, so like, I have something to contribute. But like, if you find out that you're only admitted to the college based on the race, it's like, okay, so they love me. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the um, that's one of the tragic side effects of affirmative action. It's kind of like a stigma um, that people are, you know, treated differently because of it, and, and that whether it's right or wrong, you might have had just as good grades as your, as your classmate, but people make this assumption, which is very dangerous. Now, did you guys study uh, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson? Yes. Want some of what that is? All right. Well, what what happened in that case? Um, um, <laughs> Everyone remembers that separate equal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was that Octoroon guy. He got wow. into, like, you guys are text. You actually use the word Octoroon. My God. Okay, that's that's I great. Mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he got on the uh, the little. I don't know what it was like a train car or something. Right. And they they he didn't he refused to leave, but then it was an interstate train or it was only in one state. Mm -hmm. So the government said that because it's only in that one state they can regulate. Good. Anyway, so, so Homer Plessy, he was, I think, one-eighth black. He got onto a train car that was reserved for white people. This was intentional. It was called a test case. He did this on purpose. He wanted to test this law. And the Supreme Court upheld it. He's saying he cannot ride in that car. Why? As long as there are separate train cars that have equal accommodations, it's fine. This is a doctrine of separate but equal. There was one dissenter in that case. His name was Justice John Marshall Harlan, uh, who you've probably heard of. Uh, the nonprofit I work with is a Harlan Institute, and it's named after him. And he wrote very famously that separate is not equal. That we have a colorblind constitution. Colorblind constitution. What does that mean? A colorblind constitution. Doesn't give preference to race. Doesn't give preference to race. Okay. Anyone else? What does it mean for a colorblind constitution? Yeah, yeah, white, black, green, purple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit louder? It assumes discrimination is not an issue or it makes it cool to have a problem. Good. So, what happens if our, cost, our Constitution. Yes, they're more developed. Oh, don't be tardy. Um, <laughs> so, what happens if the Constitution is colorblind, but people aren't? The Constitution is interpreted in different ways than what was originally. Yes. Is it kind of interpreted how they want to just what they did for a while? Even though it said all men are created equal, I guess they would be taken to account that all the other people also look like, or also just like you. So I guess it's just like, it kind of had to change, the interpretation of it had to change as the time went on. So we talk about equal protection. You said the government can't make preferences for race. But what happens if starting out, people aren't equal? That white people and black people are treated differently. Can the Constitution allow preferential treatment to make things equal? There's a big difference between saying the Constitution is colorblind. State universities cannot consider race at all. Or, in order for there to be equal races, the state must consider your race. In other words, to make things equal, to make things on campus fair, you need to consider diversity. You need to consider race. Isn't that what we said? Like, like with the like people who are upholding 
the separation was saying for the whites to have their like to have their fair time. So are you comparing that? segregation and people support affirmative action? Yes. <laughs> Actually, your point's not as crazy as it sounds. In uh, 2007, there was a case, a Seattle school case, which considered affirmative action. And Chief Justice Roberts, writing for four members, effectively compared affirmative action to the policy in Brown. He said, in so many words, segregating schools between white and black requires making classifications based on race. Affirmative action requires making classifications based on race. <coughs> now, the Brown program is good. It's bringing people together. I'm sorry, so the Brown policy was bad because it separated students. <laughs> Got that, I'm sorry. No, the Brown policy was bad because it separated people based on race. The affirmative action policy might be good because it brings people together. But they're both flawed in the sense that they treat race as an important factor. Does anyone else agree with him that making classifications based on race for affirmative action is similar to just straight up segregation? Wow. Wow. Uh, right there? Why? Because, like, basically, if the, they would segregate the schools, it would be harder for the blacks to come out on top and actually be in the same education level as the whites. Where now it's basically making this, like, like if we, instead of making it, calling it a boom, we could call it the standard to be what the blacks need, and then the whites need to try even harder to be on the same level as them. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? So, this is a very important point. When you have an affirmative action policy, you are admittedly discriminating based on race. This is Abigail Fisher. She's the subject of the case in Fisher versus University of Texas. She lives in Sugar Land, not too far from here. She's about 20 or 21, so about, about your age. When she applied to the University of Texas, Stanford says we can laugh, it's okay. Okay. When she applied to the University of Texas at Austin, she was denied admission. She was not in the top 10% of the class. She says the reason why she was denied admission was because she was white. She said had she been black or, or another minority, she would have gotten into UT. And she sued them for a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. She claims that the school discriminated against me because I'm white. When I asked you a couple minutes ago, do you think white people should ever need affirmative action, you kind of laughed. Does anyone think that there's discrimination against a white person? Does that make anyone kind of like chuckle? Or do you think it's, she has a good argument, she's being discriminated against because she's white? Well, she was part of the top 10%, so she still was, there was still an issue that she wouldn't be able to Right, sure. I don't think it's discrimination, like she's being specifically singled out because she's white, it's just that because someone else is being singled out in favor of their other race, another race, that she's being, it's like, there's negative consequences. Well, there's, just, there's only a certain number of people the school can admit. Say they commit a thousand people, right? If they admit one person over her, it's a fixed amount. So for every person they admit instead of her, she gets excluded. So who here thinks, raise your hands, that she was discriminated against? Hands, hands. Uh, who here thinks you should raise your hands that she was discriminated against? Based on her race. What should, I mean, assuming that the same person with her grades in SAT, if had the person been black, would have been admitted. Just, just assume those numbers are the same. Who do you think she was discriminated against? Wow. Who do you think she was not discriminated against? Good. In the back, why do you think she was not discriminated against? Well, having the idea that somebody with the same grades and same <clears throat> SAT scores was admitted instead of her, that would introduce diversity into the program. And that's one of the things that affirmative action stands for, is to introduce diversity into Well, their... but that, I'm not talking about diversity, I'm asking what she discriminated against. Oh. I think we'd all agree that admitting a, a, a person of color over her was making diversity, but was this from discrimination? Oh. <clears throat> See, the whole UT admissions policy, I think it's you could, you could say that she wasn't discriminated against because she, they abide by equal opportunity to some extent by admitting the 10%. Like, she had the opportunity to have good grades, to be in the top 10%, and that would have admitted her automatically, regardless of race. And 
and because she didn't fall into that category is why she was discriminating against. So you could say that like she had just as much chance as anybody else, and she didn't choose to take that chance. Anyone else? Does anyone know why Texas has a top 10% plan? Anyone know the history of that? <coughs> okay. So in 1996, there was a there was a court of appeals case. So you guys know the three levels of federal courts. There's a Supreme Court top, well, the Court of Appeals, and then there's a federal district court. The Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit, which is based in New Orleans and considers cases from Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, held in around 1996 a case called Hopwood that affirmative action was unconstitutional. So for a period of about seven years, in Texas and in nowhere else in the country, more or less, affirmative action was not allowed. Texas could not have an affirmative action from 1996 to about 2003. The Texas legislature in Austin had the idea of the top 10% plan. They said, well, if we admit the top 10% of every school, we'll get diversity. And for the most part, it worked. They actually, before, after the Hopwood case, they were able to get a pretty diverse class. But then in 2003, you had the affirmative action cases from Michigan, where the Supreme Court said you can have a race as a factor. And as soon as the Supreme Court said that, it went back to using race. So now, what changed? 2003, the Supreme Court said, you're allowed to use race. Now we're in 2012, nine years later. I was actually in college when the uh, Michigan case came down, and I remember it was a big, big deal. So nine years later, why are we here again? What's changed? What's changed between 2003 and 2012 on the Supreme Court? The internet allowed to use race. What? What'd you say? The rise of the internet. Good, good. What else happened? Yeah. Yeah. So who's new? Who are the new guys? Sotomayor. Good. Who else? Roberts. Who else? God. Okay. Let's name all the justices. Can you do this? Okay. Very good. Who is the chief justice? Roberts. Good. Well, let's get to nine. Give me another one. So do I you are. Good. Got Galen Nari, Dan Dan Alary, the Italian one. <laughs> 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 yeah, there are a couple Italians. Okay, so yeah, Roberts, so do I you are. Give me more. Kagan. Kagan, good. Who else? You said him before. Thomas, good. Okay, who else? <coughs> yeah, four. Four to nine. Come on. <laughs> you have enough for a quorum. You do need four justices to hear a case. Good. Who else? Who is a swing justice? You always hear about him in the news. He shares a name with the U.S. president. Kennedy. Good. Kennedy. Okay. What you saying? That might be Are you cheating with me? <laughs> Six. There are two Italian American justices. <laughs> Their names both end in vowels. <laughs> All right. Scalia? Alito? Alito? Uh huh. Ginsburg? Ruth Ginsburg? Stephen Breyer? Ready? Roberts? Scalia? Kennedy? Thomas? Uh, Ginsburg? Kennedy? Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan. You can't lead up. I can't count. I, I was never good at math. That's when I went to law school. <laughs> All right, so who's the nine? So who's new on the court since 2003? Roberts, Alito, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Good. <laughs> All right. So we have four new justices, but unfortunately, Justice Kagan will not be hearing this case. She's not involved. She's recused. They don't know what recused means. She was she has, she has, she has prior involvement in the case. Yeah? Uh, not UT. Why is she recused? She was, she was in the brief. She was at um, the Chinese. Very good. She was a Solicitor General. Who knows what the Solicitor General is? Yeah, the Solicitor General is a top lawyer in the United States. She brings all the cases to the Supreme Court. And while Kagan was the Solicitor General, she was involved in some of the briefs for this case, or some decisions about this case. Okay? So there are only eight justices in this case. Mm. 
So we always hear about these 5 4 decisions, right? 5 4, 5 4. What happens when it's 4 4? It's tied. You flip a coin? I mean, what happens? No, that's right. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors. That, that, would, that might make more sense what they do, actually. Who knows what happens when it's a tie, 4 to 4? It's upheld. It's upheld. It, good, it's upheld. But it makes no new law. It's actually called affirmed by an equally divided margin. The Supreme Court actually doesn't change anything. Everything stays as it is, 4-4. Four, four. The lower court here said the affirmative action program was OK. If the court splits 4-4, four, four, the affirmative action program survives. Okay. So in other words, there needs to be five votes to strike down this law. So the biggest thing that's changed in the last nine years is two votes. Chief Justice Rehnquist was replaced by Justice Rob Chief Justice Roberts. Justice O'Connor, this is a key one, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female justice, was replaced by Justice Alito. In Michigan case, O'Connor voted to save the program. She was a fifth vote. Justice Alito, for replacement, not a fan of affirmative action. In the Seattle school case I mentioned from 2007, he would have been willing to get rid of all affirmative action. But Justice Kennedy would not go that far. So this case will tee up the issue is if affirmative action is done everywhere. There could be very broad ranging implications for this. Affirmative action isn't just used in higher education. Where else is affirmative action used? Jobs, Jobs business. Any ROTC guys here? Mm -hmm. Military recruiting? Government placements? It's used in a lot of places. This notion that in order to make things equal, we need to have race-based preferences, giving preferences based on race. It's used in a lot of places. And if the Supreme Court strikes this down, all that goes out the window. That's a big deal. A really, really big deal. And for almost 30 years, the Supreme Court has kind of gone back and forth considering whether this should be happening. Okay. Let me try and see if this video will work. I don't, I don't know if it will. Of Abigail. It won't work here? Yeah, YouTube doesn't work. I tried loading it before, and then this, this might work, but I don't know. I make the promises. before the court once again. The first time the Supreme Court dealt with the issue was in a 1978 case called Regents of University of California v. Backey. In this case, the court held that a California medical school violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution by setting a specific quota for minority students during the admissions process. Then, in a 2003 case called Grutter v. Bollinger, the court revisited the issue, this time upholding the university's admission plan that took an applicant's race into account for the purpose of ensuring diversity on campus. In the wake of these cases, the University of Texas created an admissions program that uses race as one factor in admissions decision-making. Abigail Fisher, a Texas high school student, filed suit against the University of Texas at Austin when she was denied admissions from the school. She argued that when the University of Texas considered her race in rejecting her application... You can thank your IT people for blocking YouTube. That's all I can get. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, it never occurred. Yes, so um, that's the Fisher case, and that's what the Supreme Court's going to decide tomorrow. Tomorrow, 
This was actually, this was, this timing was not accidental. I did this on purpose, right? We replanned this like a month ago, so this was good. Yeah, actually, she, she asked me like, the second week of class if I want to come to your school. I was like, absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. I know it's how far Katie was, but it's a little late, but it's still so good. Yes? Now, the decision is tomorrow, or? The court is hearing arguments tomorrow. So you guys know how the Supreme Court case works generally? So, where does a, where does a case start out? What's, what's the lowest court called? Okay, and then what happens? Good, and then what happens? What is it called when a party who loses in the Court of Appeals wants to go to the Supreme Court? What do they ask for? Good, certiorari, you guys, big words. What's, what does that mean? Oh. <laughs> the Supreme Court only hears the cases it wants. It only takes certain cases. A writ of certiorari says, hey, Supreme Court, take my case. Call me maybe. You know, as a Supreme Court, exactly right. It's like maybe. And it's granted in favor of the party who loses. So the party who loses follows this writ, and the Supreme Court might take it. You know, they hear about 70 or 80 cases a year. I think there are over there are tens of, about 10 or 20,000 petitions a year. So they take a very small number of cases. They took this case, they took Abigail Fisher's case. So we know that they're going to hear her case tomorrow. So tomorrow there are going to be several lawyers arguing on behalf of the parties. There will be a lawyer arguing on behalf of Abigail Fisher. There will be a lawyer arguing on behalf of the University of Texas. And also there will be a lawyer arguing on behalf of the United States. The lawyer arguing on behalf of Fisher, Abigail, I'll bring her picture back up, right there. The lawyer arguing on behalf of Abigail is going to argue that she was discriminated against. That as a white applicant to the University of Texas, she was subject to discrimination. They treated her differently because of her color of her skin. UT will argue that, yeah, we did. We did treat her differently because of her skin color, but that's okay. Why? Because we need diversity on campus. This is a compelling interest. It's something very important. So we need diversity. And the only way to achieve diversity will be by admitting her based on race. Hey, guys. So we know that there are these two positions. Is there a way of achieving diversity without affirmative action? Yes. Okay. Other than a top ten percent, can you achieve diversity without affirmative action? You can look at it not based on but what if it turns out we only admit people based on scores the class look pretty white and Asian, which is <laughs> which is frankly what was happening in a lot of cases. They can take an ec economic factors instead of race factors. And yeah. Just over time, as races eventually equal out, diversity will occur naturally as opposed to being forced. So do we wait? Do we sit here and allow discrimination to happen in the meantime for you know black people to be unable to go to good schools while we're waiting for this equality to happen? Uh, affirmative action is just speeding it up. So it's a temporary solution. Yes, ma'am. Affirmative action should be all inclusive, not necessarily not necessarily aimed towards yourself. Yeah. Yes. So you have your admissions application. What kind of boxes would you be checking off? How would how would you how would you put that down in a, you guys have to fill college applications real soon? I'm sure you know what exactly they look like. How would you how would you assess that in a college admission at UT? You would probably get twenty thousand applicants a year, thirty thousand applicants a year. Single A school, five A school. Trying to increase diversity um, is having where because I know that for some scholarships available for minorities instead of necessarily having where they get accepted because of the race, but having more money to go with. Would that be a form of discrimination? What if Abigail Fisher had gotten into UT and was denied a scholarship because she was white? Any problem with that? Are those offered by the by the government, by the state? Are they private scholarships? 
So there's a general principle that individuals are free to discriminate, uh, more or less. We, we, studied, we studied a couple of cases about this in class the other night, where private parties usually, you know, be racist. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing in the Constitution prohibiting individuals from being discriminatory. But when the state is giving the scholarships, or when the state is giving admission, you can use a state, state institution, they're bound by the equal protection clause. So let's let's do a show. What time do we have till ten thirty? Ten twenty seven. Okay, good. So let's let's do a show of hands. Who here thinks that the Supreme Court will find that affirmative action is or forget the Supreme Court. Who here thinks that affirmative action should be unconstitutional? Now. Twenty twelve, right? Right here, right now. In this classroom. Okay? It's about Okay? Okay. So, who here thinks that affirmative action sh is constitutional? Okay, good. Now let me ask a different question. Who here thinks that affirmative action is a bad policy, putting inside the Constitution? Hmm. Interesting. So some of you thought that, it's a that affirmative action is constitutional, but it's a bad policy. So someone who raised their hand for both questions, that it was Constitutional, but a bad policy. Who raised your hand for both questions? Why do you think both? It's a very, very good position to take, but why do you think that's the case? Well, it's like, I guess it makes it so it seems like it's forced. So it's like, um, it's like all the different races that are included for it. I guess they just, they end up not really, um, I don't know what this is. Okay. Um, it's like, it, it doesn't work. So, you're discriminating either way. So, who do we have more sympathy for? Abigail? Or, or a, a black student who got denied admission because her scores weren't as high, or couldn't get in on, her, on other, other means? Who do we have more sympathy for? Why? Guilt. Guilt? What do you mean guilt? <laughs> <laughs> someone break that armor, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean guilt? No, um, legitimately, because like, of our past actions, like, wanting to make amends is, like, normally guilt-based, not just, oh, we should do this, with, like... Okay. Now, when you say our, who's our? Our being, um, okay, that part of the white majority. Um, majorities are. Okay. Well, let's break that down a little bit. You were all born in 1995, right? Ish? 94, 95? So, during the Clinton administration at some point, right? So, were any of you personally involved in things that would make people guilty? No. But you still feel guilt bound by stuff your ancestors might have done? <laughs> or any of you um, immigrants that might have come here in the not too you know, recent years, your families. You know, my my mom came here after World War II. I you know they, they, they grew up in Brooklyn. They weren't really involved in too much, you know, slavery and stuff in Brooklyn in the 1950s. Uh, does anyone think there might be any conceptual problems with with putting guilt, the word you use, for people who were really born long after after uh, uh, the worst atrocities happened? You anyone know, see any problems there? Yes. Oh, thanks. Well, we're trying to make up for stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, finish. I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. Okay. Yes. It's like shoving anachronistic standards to a generation. Shoving what standards? Anachronistic. It's out of time. Oh, anachronistic. Ana ana hmm? SATs yeah. will last year. We're done yeah. with that stuff, right? <laughs> SATs writing, not to speak. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like it doesn't apply until like a new generation might have, you know, a different <coughs> values than we're like forced to believe the ones from half a century ago. Right. But I think we all would agree that there is still racism today. Yeah. It's not gone. And it can't be eliminated overnight. This is a generational process. If you are, I mean, many, many students here, you know, who were born in the 90s or whatever, parents were probably born in the 60s and 70s. You know, there was still some bad stuff back then. Their grandparents were probably alive in the 30s and 40s, right? 
What's that? My family's young. Well, <laughs> youngin, it's okay. So this is a multi-generational process. But I'm glad you guys hit on this question about the differences between is it constitutional or is it good policy? These are very different questions that I think the Supreme Court often grapples with itself. Just because something's bad policy doesn't mean it's unconstitutional. Just because something's good policy doesn't make it unconstitutional. There are lots of things we want to do and we can't because of the Constitution. There are lots of things we'd love to do but can't because of the Constitution. And I think that's a good takeaway. We've had a very good discussion about affirmative action, its pros and its cons, the good and the bad. Does it hurt people? Does it help people? And then at heart, we have Abigail. She actually just graduated from LSU, uh, or she will graduate, I think, this year. So she's done with college. So this, this case won't really matter much for her, but it matters for everyone in this room. You're all applying to UT. There will be an affirmative action policy when you apply it this year, no doubt. The Supreme Court will decide this case in June. If it's struck down, your friends who are juniors now will not have that policy next year. For all you know, you might be the last class admitted to UT because of affirmative action. You might be the last ever. Think about that. Be high fiving. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> these guys are crying. <laughs> so, so, think about that. You are probably the last class that might be admitted to UT because of affirmative action. I mean, you'll come back next year and hang out with you in Austin, and we can ask and see how this goes. So just think about that. And think how it affects you personally. And think how it might affect your friends who are juniors who are applying next year. And how, how they might have difficulty getting in. And think of, you know, black students and white students and how they'll do. Think about when you guys are at UT and you're seniors. And you look around and your class as a senior is pretty diverse and the freshman class is a bunch of white kids. <laughs> think, think how that might make you feel. So you guys are at a really good vantage point to see how this goes both ways. We've got 10 minutes left, so I will open up for questions, but thank you very much. Cool. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, for the court case, you said there is going to be uh, the U.S. or was represented by a lawyer? Yeah, the Solicitor General. Is that because they wanted a four, like a 4-4 four, four vote, so that way that the law won't be changed in either? Well, the United States would love a 4-4 four, four vote, but they prefer a 9-0 vote in favor of them. Uh, the U.S. President Obama's lawyer, uh, his name is Donald Verrilli, the Solicitor General, wants affirmative action. He thinks it's a good thing. He thinks it's important for diversity. Another reason why is the United States government has a lot of affirmative action in its hiring policies and its military recruiting. So the government has a very strong interest in making sure this policy survives the Supreme Court. So that's why they're arguing. Usually whenever the government wants to argue in a case, the Supreme Court lets them. Usually they're not involved. The government can always come in and say something. Yes, Can it be just like they get rid of affirmative action in schools and leave it in the military and stuff like that? They could. They could. They could have a holding that says using these racial classifications is only good for certain purposes and diversity in a college campus is not one of them. And that could leave the possibility that it's okay in other places. In fact, in the Michigan affirmative action case, one of the biggest um, decision factors was a brief actually from a number of retired generals from the Army who wrote that if you get rid of affirmative action, we'll have a difficulty maintaining and recruiting a diverse army. They argued that if we're in wars in different countries, we want our soldiers to look like the people who were there to have people you know, involved with them, engage with them, they can interact with them, people speak different languages. And using race is a very important factor in military recruiting. So that's a, that could be another issue that comes up again. Yes, It's a really complicated factor. It's like a fa race is a factor within a factor within a factor. Um, and <laughs> in, in, lar in large exceptions, it's kind of just rubbish. I mean, they, they, they say, well, we look at race in this context, we look at race in this context, we measure it with this, we have this and this, and it's all holistic. It's all gobbledygook. It, there, there's no real way of looking at it. It's fair to say that the people in the admissions office know what they're doing, and they know how they're looking at race, and even they have all these other policies they're considering quite strongly. But it's a good question. There's no good answer. Yes, in the back. A little bit louder, please.
is that ever going to change, especially with the way America is going now? Like, if we were going to diversity, obviously, there would be more and more people that aren't for blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll answer part of that question. Um, so, yeah, race is, is an interesting issue. I mean, most of it is self-identification. When you apply and you check your box, you don't have to send in a cover shot or headshot with you. They're not going to ask to see, like, you know, you know, a picture of your family. Um, you know, I can imagine circumstances where, where it's happened that people from South Africa, you know, claim they're African American. Yeah, you are. are you, do you consider yourself African American? I'm North Africa. North Africa or South Africa? Oh no, but the country of South Africa, I meant, oh. which was mostly colonized by by Dutch people. So um, now, do you consider yourself African American? Has anyone ever given you any trouble about that? Yeah. So a lot of it is about self-identification. How do you see yourself? And if people might be half, you know, one, one parent's black, one parent's white, they claim they're black, and then they take advantage of it, and they, they, they write down their application. So, you know, it's a very tricky issue because it makes people force themselves into a box. And people aren't easily susceptible to a specific box because there are a lot of different uh, there are a lot of different institutional concerns within your family about how you're defined and who you are. Okay. More questions? Yes, uh, in the back. I got a question. Um, does affirmative action apply to like private universities too, or just like the state? Um, so schools don't have to have affirmative action. What ends up happening is um, various accreditation agencies. You know what that is? So in order for a school to be like a legitimate school, they need to be accredited by some sort of body. You know, for example, law school, something called the American Association of Law Schools. So in order to be a good law school, you have to be, meet certain standards. And most of those groups require a certain type of diversity on campus. So the government doesn't actually require it, but in practice, most schools have to have something or else they'll get in trouble. Um, there are a couple private schools that take no federal money and they can admit people as ever they want, but that's probably the slim minority. Most schools probably have some form of uh, race-based preferences. Any questions? Any questions about um, law school, uh, where I teach, being a lawyer, anything about that? Anyone thinking about law school? Anyone want to be with your teacher? Three? Four? <laughs> what? Anyone else think about law school? Yeah, maybe? It's an interesting path. What do you guys think? For those of you who want to go to law school, what do you think about majoring in college? Any thoughts? <coughs> Physics, okay. <laughs> Criminal justice? Okay. Any political science? Philosophy? Economics? Government? Computers? That's why I study computers in college. It's, it's an interesting profession, and um, as your teacher will tell you, she's a, she's a very good student. And um, it's true. And it's funny, because whenever I ask a question about, about government, she's the only person who knows, because most people don't know anything about government, and she knows all the answers. Like, we talk about, you know, how does the Constitution work, or which branch is this, which branch is this, she knows all the answers, which is very good. So if you're considering law school, take some political science courses, take some government courses, take some civics courses, take maybe a class in constitutional law. I think you'll really like it. Um, it's a fun path, a lot of work, uh, a lot of homework, right? Do I give a lot of homework? No, not work. Okay, good. I try to connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, yes, in the back. In, in law school, you take classes in everything. You don't really specialize. It's kind of unique among other, other areas of study. But while you're in law school, you can try and find various jobs and, and internships with, the, for example, a prosecutor's office or a public defender's office to do defense work. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. It's very expensive. Uh, I don't even want to even know how much she's paying for her tuition. But um, it's a big investment. And being a lawyer is not easy. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it if you get through it. But it's a lot of work. Three minutes left. Any other questions? Last chance. I have a quick question. Yes. How much will the since California and Michigan have statutes banning affirmative action? I think that diversity has decreased at the universities there. Will that be considered? Or, I mean, I'm sure that. So, so yeah, at the, that, 
um, I'm actually somewhat limited. There's a case in Michigan I actually worked on for the Judge Clerk, so I won't talk about that one. But in California, you're absolutely right. There was a, um, a statute passed banning affirmative action, and the number of minorities are just dwindled. It's decreased significantly. Now it's mostly white nations. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, and, and it's just it's just greatly decreased. And in arguments that they, those groups have filed briefs saying, hey, if you get rid of this, you won't work. Now Texas is the top 10% plan, but the other 49 states don't. So if this program goes out the window, other states will have to find other ways of increasing diversity in the absence of affirmative action. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What's that? Law doesn't require a PhD to teach. Yeah, you can get one, but not required. But I think I'm an, I'm an unqualified professor, right? Very qualified. That's an unqualified. Huh? That's an unqualified. I know, and I said very qualified. She's lying. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Good luck with college admission. I was very impressed. Good job. By all today. Job. Very impressed. Two thumbs up. Um, don't forget about the chapter six quiz tomorrow. If you need study questions that I passed out last week, swing by the room. I still have some extras. They're also on the Facebook page. If they're not, I'll double check. I'll double check and make sure they are. Um, Y'all sit tight, the bell will ring in about two or three minutes, five minutes. Well, and Professor Blackman, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. And we've got a thank you gift. You can be purpled out on Fridays. <laughs> I think, I think so. <laughs> Alright, thanks everyone. Person, uh, Mexican, Cuban, or Jewish, 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 or Jewish,